Welcome, we are so glad you joined us online. Today we launch our new sermon series, Eternity. We will be learning how to live this life for that life. This series will change the way you look at your day-to-day -day life and shift your focus onto the next life. You don't want to miss all that is in store throughout this series. So join us every week here online or join us at a campus near you. You can view our locations and service times at destiny.online slash go. Very excited about tonight. Really believe God's going to minister to you and give you something that we all need in our lives. Um, and that is what we're talking about. We're in a series on eternity if you're here for the first time. And, and, uh, and we've just been in this great journey. And that's what destiny is about. It's, 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 it's more than a church. We're a community of, of believers and family that are on just on this journey together. And so that's, that's what's amazing. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, here's what it says. It says, yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. Just, just, just park that for a moment. Because at the end of the day, beauty doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. And sometimes your life may not look like you want it to look like. But at the end of the day, it's becoming what it's going to look like. And embrace those seasons. Because in the promise you have is that it will beautify itself. Nobody buys a rose that hasn't been blossomed because they don't see beauty in it. But the rose that you will spend money on is already inside. So just look at your life like that. It says he's planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to the end. I want to talk to you today about what it's like to have treasures in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the spirit of revelation. Give our minds illumination that we would experience transformation. Lord, I pray you give us a mind to perceive, a heart to receive all that you have. And I ask that after this message, we will never be the same. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say, amen. 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 You may be seated. If you don't have a message outline, our ushers would be more than happy to get you one. We've been in this series and we're talking about eternity because what we're really trying to show you in this whole endeavor, this journey that we're on is that what we're going through and what we're facing today is temporary. We live in a temporal world. And yet what we ought to be living for is something that will outlive us. And that's eternity. There's an old saying that says, you only live once. We all, in some sense, did things we didn't want to do because we fell into the trap of our friends telling us, come on, man, you only live once. I remember being at Six Flags Magic Mountain. You know, when you're a little kid, those rides are incredible and you want to ride as much as you want. And, and, it's, and the crazier they are, the more you want to ride them. And I realized because as a little kid, you got nothing to lose. As an adult, those rides are crazy, but you're thinking about if I die, I'm losing everything. And so I was with a couple of my friends and they said, come on, let's do it. And I'm like, man, I'm good. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm good, I, you know. Oh, come on. Oh, bad man, we're going to do it. It's going to be incredible. Let's do it, man. And I'm like, man, you know, my, my, we was on the last ride. My stomach's hurting. You know, I mean, you just start going with all kinds of excuses. And then finally, my friend said this word. He said, oh, bad. Come on, man. We only live once. I could go back a lot of times in my life, things I didn't want to do, yet I was pressured to do. Because of that one saying, you only live once. But the truth of the matter is, you don't live once, you live twice. You're going to have an afterlife while you're living in this life. And this life will determine your afterlife. And so this whole thing that we're talking about is that how God placed eternity in your heart. He didn't place joy in your heart, didn't place peace in your heart yet. You weren't born with love in your heart. You weren't born with faith in your heart. You were born with something that nothing temporal 
can fill it. And so as you begin to grow up and experience things that you thought would fill that void in your heart, the older and more mature you become, the more you started thinking about the next life. You started to think about what it would be like. Because there's something in your heart that God placed that was a longing for something that will outlive you. And that's eternity. And so how do we live for that? This life for that life. Well, we've talked about many things. And today what I want to talk to you about is our treasures. That God gives us time. And in time, we get to use our talent. And with time and talent will determine your treasure. And so how do I make an internal impact with the treasures God has given me? Paul's writing to Timothy, a very young minister, overseeing a great work. And he says this, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money. And he's, he's, what he's saying is, is if you're going to teach them on faith, then they'll, they'll learn how to live in faith. And if you teach them on relationships, then they're going to know how to have dynamic relationships. So teach them about something that can either make their life or break their life. And he says this, he says, which is so unreliable because their trust should be in God. Now that sounds very religious, but it's very true. Who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. And so at the end of the day, what you have and what you've been blessed with is for one reason, and that is that God wants you to enjoy it. It's like you mentioned the word money in church and everyone gets scared. Let me just kind of give you a little disclaimer. There's no offering tonight, okay? Church is great. We're doing fantastic, all right? But, but at the end of the day, we, we get scared to talk about it because it's like, man, that's just an area that, that I'm uncomfortable with. It should be an area that you want to grow in. It should be an area that, man, as much as I want to grow in, in my marriage, I also want to learn to grow in my stewardship. I want to grow in the things that God wants me to really enjoy. And he says this, tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich, listen to me, in good works and generous to those who are in need. Watch this. Always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience this true life. In other words, God has given me this thing called time. I wake up every morning and I wake up in time. And in that time, I get myself dressed to go to work to use my talent. And with the time and the talent, my reward comes as a treasure. So it's God that gave me the time. It is God that has given me the ability called talent. And yet it's for the enjoyment of having treasure. But I can take the treasure that I have and I can do good with it and make an eternal impact that will outlive me. There comes a time in your life when you're so inundated about building your life. Then there comes a time in your life when you have children and you're wanting to build their life. And then there comes that time in your life when you're wanting to build the next life. I build first for myself. I build then for my children, and then I finally build for my legacy. At the end of the day, everybody wants their time with their talent and their treasure to outlive them. This is what God's talking about. Because in other words, what he's saying is we live for heaven while we're living on earth. We live for something far greater than what we're experiencing today. It's amazing that God is 
is, is doing this and he's speaking to us about what type of eternal impact will we make? So when we're talking about heaven and we're talking about this thing, this place that we're all going, this experience we're going to have, we got to understand some realities. And some of the realities we got to understand is that number one, heaven, not earth, is my home. Heaven, not earth, is my home. I'm, I'm kind of just passing through this place. I love what the Bible says in Philippians chapter three. Look what it says. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there may be many those who conduct shows that they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Watch this. Their God is their, is their appetite. They brag about the shameful things. And they think only about this life on earth. And so that's all we're talking about. We got nothing else to talk about because we got nothing else to live for. And then look what they say. Listen, it says this. Let's all say it together. Verse 20, it says, but we are citizens of heaven. Come on, let's say that one more time. But we are citizens of heaven. So if I'm a citizen of heaven, then heaven is my home, earth is my passing through. And so at the end of the day, I'm not trying to make it on earth more than I'm trying to make, where, where I'm more than I'm trying to make what I'm doing on earth, the impact I will have in heaven. So I am a citizen of another place, and that place we will all return to. And look what it says. It goes on to say this, and it says this. Where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. Now, I want you to, I want you to, I want you to get this because imagine the disciples. You know, Jesus is with you. You know, he's healing people, and they're doing amazing, he's doing amazing things. And then he says, hey, guys. I'm going to be leaving you. And they're like, uh, well, where are you going? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going back home. But, 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 but we just started this journey. You can't leave us right now. And Jesus is like, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. And he goes, they're like, Lord, you told us to drop our nets, leave our families, everything behind. And now you're going to abandon us. He goes, no, no, I'm not abandoning you. And, and I love what he says. Listen to me. Here's what he says. He says, I'm leaving you to go and prepare a place for you. Listen to me. He left his disciples to go and prepare a place for them. All throughout the scripture, everywhere God was taking you, he was taking you and preparing you for a place he has prepared for you. He didn't deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt just to deliver them. He delivered them out of something because he had a prepared place for them called Canaan, a land that was flowing with milk and honey. So he, this is why none of us should never cry over a door that's closed over our lives. Because if a door is closed in over our lives, it's not the fact that God's done with us. It's that God has done with us in that season because he has prepared another place for us. And so you are being prepared for a prepared place that he's prepared for you. Come on, are you hearing me? And so this is why you and I got to get this understanding that God is doing all these things in our life, but why he's doing all these things in our life, he is there called heaven preparing a place for us. So you and I, when the trumpet sound, thun, 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 right, and, it's, and we're gonna, the bride's going to be caught up, we're going to walk into something called heaven, past the pearly gates, streets of gold, rubies and sapphires you've never seen before, and it's all being prepared now. So God is not just working with you on earth, but he is also working your place in heaven. And so at the end of the day, you got to realize heaven is my home, not earth. My investment is in my home. It's not in my hotel. The reason why we got to get this revelation of heaven is is heaven is my home and not earth. The second thing is, is because there is limited time and opportunity. There's limited time and there's incredible opportunity. And this is my treasures. This is what I use my talents and this is what I use my time for. And look what Ephesians says this. It says, it says, so be careful how you live. 
Why am I careful how I live on earth? Because how I live on earth determines what my next place is going to be like. So I want to be careful how I live. Now that I'm a servant of Christ, now, man, I'm going to church. People are watching you and they're like, oh, where are you going tonight? I'm going to church. Church? Come on. Seriously? You ain't going to church. You lying. You ain't going to church. You know you're going somewhere else. No, I'm going to church. And all of a sudden, they start watching your life. This is what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians when he says you're a written and living epistle. People are reading your life. They're watching you. God is making you his display of his glory and his splendor to people because if they can't believe the Bible because they don't have faith to believe in it, at least they will believe your life. Because at the end of the day, because at the end of the day, you can debate the Bible, but you can't debate a changed life. It's convinced all you want. And so at the end of the day, they're, they're looking at you. And, 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 and so this is why we got to be careful how we live and, and don't live like fools. But like those who are wise. Wise in what? Wise in what I'm living for. Watch this. Here it is, verse 16. Listen, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. I want you to hear me today. I want you to hear me today. Every day is another opportunity. No, no, no. Hear me today. Every day is another opportunity. Stop looking at your day as another obstacle. My tomorrow, if I got to go to court, it's not an obstacle. It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity that God's going to display his glory in my life. And what the enemy's meant for bad, God's going to turn it around for the good. Man, man, if, if, if tomorrow does it, I got to go to a doctor's appointment, I'm not looking at that as an obstacle. I'm looking at that as an opportunity because it's another opportunity for God to display his splendor and glory in my life. Because at the end of the day, this is all temporal. I'm living for something bigger, something greater, something more magnificent than what I'm facing today. So don't look at your life. Man, tomorrow, man, I'm just going to have to face another thing. No, stop looking like that because you're either going to look at your life as an obstacle or you're going to look at it as an opportunity. And if you're looking at it as an obstacle, then you're looking at it through the lens of your ability and your talent and your time. But if you look at it through through the lens of opportunity, you're looking at it through the lens of eternity. You're looking at it through the lens of the fact that God's going to take you beyond your own limitations to get you where he desires your life to be because he's already prepared that place for you. No, look at your life as an opportunity. Why, 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 why? man, I, I want to live like this every day. I want to live with the fact that heaven's my home and not earth. I want to live every day with the fact that I have, I have this incredible opportunity to make kingdom impact in people's lives. And then I live for eternity because at the end of the day, it is just smart. It's smart. I, I've, I've, I've lived dumb the majority of my life. I've made dumb decisions. I've made, I've done some dumb things. And living for something greater allows me to live smart. Look what Matthew talks about what smart looks like. He says this. Don't store up your treasures on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. He says, but smart people store their treasures in heaven. They're making this impact. They're bringing friends to church. Man, they're they're, they're inviting them into a life group. They're taking their talent once a month and they're using it in God's house. I am investing in eternity. I'm investing in someone else's eternity. That is living smart. And he, and, he, and he goes on to say this. He says, but store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Watch this. He says, wherever your treasure is, wherever you find value, wherever it is, He says, there the desires of your heart will also be. 
every day. You find value in your children. And so the time and the talent and the treasure you give them is the worth that you see them as. So God sees you the same way. You were broken, so he invested in you. He gave you his greatest at your worst. And he didn't see trash. He saw treasure. He saw something inside of you that he planted that has to blossom. And when you saw your life inadequate, when you saw your life insufficient, he saw something different. And this is why many of us struggle, struggled, and even some of us still struggle and fathom that thought today. How could God love me? How could God be so good to me? And every time we say that, we're looking at it through the lens of our own failures. Because what you're saying is, I don't see that kind of value in my life, which means I wouldn't even invest in my life right now. But anyone who's smart buys low in order to one day to sell high. So God knows exactly when to get you. He's a wise investor. He's not going to, he's not going to, he is not going to, hey, come on. And you're not even listening because your treasures are in yourself. Your treasures in your lifestyle. Your treasures are in your sin. Your treasures are in all these other things that are trying to fulfill your flesh. And this, this time that he gave you, this talent that he placed inside of you, you're using it for the wrong thing. And that's why your treasure is like moths. You know what moths do? They come and they what they do, they eat at your clothes. And when they eat at their clothes, they make holes in your clothes so that whatever goes through just falls out. And so your mind is, well, if I just keep on making more, then I'll have have more, but you don't realize the more you make, the more holes you got. And so it just continues to fall through. And then you sit there and go, man, I'm making more, but I'm more broke than I ever been because your treasures are invested in the wrong place and in the wrong things because it's all about me. You're not making this eternal impact because at the end of the day, you will do anything for somebody that wants to invest in something you find valuable. When somebody takes your kids to get ice cream, you want to return the favor back as soon as possible because they invested in them. When you begin to invest in God's people, God eagerly can't wait to bless your socks off because he's sitting there saying, you see my children outside these walls who are so broken and lost, you see them the way I see them, that you're willing to invest in them when nobody else is invested? You mean to tell me you're seeing their treasure in their trash right now? Yes, Lord, I'm okay, because you want to do that, I want to supernaturally bless you like you have no idea, because at the end of the day, that, that's what a natural father wants to do. Hey, you're going to invest in my children? Oh, I'm going to do whatever I can to make anything possible for you, and, and, because at the end of the day, when you invest in the child, you you're really investing in the father. And so every time we invest in God's children who are far from him, we are invested in the kingdom. We're investing in the father. We're making it happen for them and God makes it happen for us. Come on, are you hearing me? So I want to help people because it is something that I'm living for that, 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 that in some sense outlives me. And so Jesus is is, is instilling these principles that are eternally impacting the people there. And we all know that Jesus often spoke in parables. And really the reason why he spoke in parables is because he was just trying to be understanding, getting the people to understand it's no good to, to know the Bible and not really try to not understand it. Right. And so you can get theological and homiletical and hermeneutical, but what good is it? If you don't understand it. And so Jesus spoke incredible biblical principles, but he put it in their language for them to understand and oftentimes spoke metaphorically with analogies to get the principle to come forth. And so he, he speaks this, this, this parable in Luke 12, and, and he says this, he says, and, and he told them this parable, and he said, 
The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. He says, what I'll do is I will, this will, I have no place. He goes, then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns, build bigger ones, and there will I store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain, watch this, laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. I want to park there for a moment because the church has got to a place to where it's very comfortable to talk about being poor and it's not comfortable talking about being rich. Okay, I'm gonna stop here for a moment, okay? Because at the end of the day, we find in some sense significance in helping people when they're poor in which we should because the Bible says those who lend to the poor lend to the Lord. But what good is it if the people that God wants to bless cannot bless those who themselves at this time are not blessed. So we find comfort. Oh, yeah, you know, we're just struggling, you know. Yeah, pastor, keep on preaching that. You know, we're going to make it one day. But what happens when you do make it? I'm going to sit here. I'm going to help you out here, okay? God loves the rich just as much as he loves the poor. And at the end of the day, you make the choice on which side you want to be on. God already decided that for you. I want you blessed. But I don't want you blessed for yourself. I want you to bless to be a, a blessing. So I want you to have enough, but I want you to have so much more that you can help others. And so at the end of the day, it's like, oh, man, you know, um, you know, being rich. I mean, at the end of the day, it's like, you know, if you read the Bible, pastor, being rich is a lot of the rich people went to hell. No, no, no. It was never about status more than it was about stature. It was it was if you study, I did a message on this. It was never about them being rich and, and because of their wealth, they went to hell. No, it was because of their greed. And so in the Bible, you have people like Nebuchadnezzar, who was wealthy in resources, poor in spirit. But then you had the widow's might, who was poor in resources, but wealthy in spirit. And so poor and rich has nothing to do with what's spiritual. It's always the condition of your own heart. Because the condition of your heart determines the condition of your pockets. And so at the end of the day, you got to get past that because most of us, I was raised in a church like that, man, don't you get a nice car, man, you better park it around the block because everyone's going to talk about you. Did God make them for just a certain kind of people or did he make them for all his people? God wants you blessed. God wants you blessed to be a so he's sharing this parable, and oftentimes people would stop there and say, see, I told you, you cannot go and buy you a bigger place to store more that you have because you're going to go to hell. No, God was saying the reason why he rebukes him, and it says, but God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be de demanded from you. The reason why God was rebuking him was because he wasn't building a bigger house to store it more so he could be a blessing to other people. He was, he was telling him you're a fool by storing up more for yourself. Because then at the end of the day, you're not making an eternal impact and you're not being wise with the blessings I've given you. So it's not that God's not opposed for you to have more than enough. It's that he's opposed to you that when you have that, you are not generous to help those that at one time had your lifestyle of being poor. So the purpose of me being blessed is not for myself. The purpose of me being blessed is that I can have a heart to go back to the people that at one time I was living that kind of life and I can be a blessing to them. So don't apologize for the blessings of God over your life. Man, give God praise and glory for that. Because at the end of the day, think about what a greater help you could be to more people. 
and more lives you can impact like never before. Of recently, I was in one of our, our kings, and, and, and we call them here. They're, 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 they're in the business world, and they're out there, and they're doing it. And this couple is doing it, and, and, and they're doing a great job in, in their business. Business is growing incredible. And they landed up journeying with us, and, and we led them to a, a great place. And their lives at this place were radically changed. When I saw him at my life group, all he can say was, thank you so much for for encouraging us in this next step. And here's what's his next words. Pastor, I want to bless couples and send them to this place. In other words, he was saying, I'm going to use my barns that I got storehouses filled to make an impact on other people's lives of the impact I just got. Are you hearing me? And so at the end of the day, you want your barns filled so that the impact that God has placed on your life, you can be a blessing to somebody else. How do I do this? How do I live this life of being rich towards God? Number one, I got to give yourself to God. Every part of your life. Like, God, I'm not just giving you my hands and my head. I'm giving you my feet, too. I'm giving you my heart, my mouth, and my ears. I'm giving you everything in my life because at the end of the day, I want you to use me. I want to be rich towards God. I don't want to be rich. I want to be rich towards God. That's the life I want to live. 1 Corinthians says this. It says, do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not of your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So, man, God, this is what I want to do. You've given me talent. You've given me time to get the treasure. And I want to make sure, God, that in all I do, I'm honoring you. So how do I honor God with my body? How do I do that every day? Number one, being a vessel of God. Being a vessel of honor for him. No, they God, I'm a conduit. A vessel is something that something flows right through. So God, let heaven flow right through me. So when I go to work and I, tomorrow, and I have this overwhelming joy inside my life and somebody doesn't, I have enough joy in my storehouse to satisfy me, but also give to somebody else. Man, I, man give, me, give me faith, God. Because you're going to run into somebody this weekend and they're going to tell you, whether it's on the phone or you're going to run into, it's going to be in a conversation, they're going to say something like this, I'm going through something right now and I can't bear it. I'm struggling. You're going to have a conversation soon with somebody like that. But because you have faith in your life and you have more faith in your storehouse, you can sit there and say, hey, I got some faith that I can give to you right now. What do you mean, pastor? The Bible says, if two touch and agree, ask anything in my name, so shall it come to pass. And so at the end of the day, you have enough faith to, hey, man, I'll hold you. Man, I'll walk with you. Man, I'll I'll journey with you. When you couldn't believe for yourself, someone believed for you. Pastor Obed, no one's ever prayed for me. No, that's incorrect. Jesus said a prayer that is still being answered today because prayers don't expire. They only aspire. And and he stood on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they've done. When you and I didn't even have the ability because we were so filled with shame and guilt and rejection, we didn't know how to say, 
Father, forgive me. No, he said it for us before we ever said it out of our own mouths. And so in other words, he, he, he had enough in his barn, not just for himself, but for you and I as well. That is what it's called being rich towards, towards God. That I, 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 God just don't got enough for me, but I got enough for you. That's, that, that's, that's what God said. So I want to be this vessel of honor. The, the next thing I want is, is I want to use my gifts and talents to honor him. And you do. You use it in the marketplace. You're going to wake up tomorrow morning and you're going to go to work and you're going to use your gifts and talents. And, 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 and in that talent, you're going to do it within the realm of time. And in that realm of time with your talent, you're going to be blessed with treasures. Those treasures take care of your needs on earth. But what about using that talent within the realm of time that you're investing in other people's lives, like joining the volunteer team and making an eternal impact on someone's life, like sitting there and saying, I'm going to take one service a month and I'm going to be used of God to make an impact on their life like somebody else made an impact on mine. What if you all got to a place where you said, Lord, what you've given me in your house, I want to give to you. Some of you, it's just a smile and a handshake and say, welcome to destiny. But you don't understand that when you walked in this door, you were hurt. You, were, you had a little bit of church. I don't know. But it was that one person that had a smile on their face and said, welcome. And the wall came down a little bit welcome and you walked out going dang these are the nicest people <laughs> you didn't walk out saying wow that was the best message i've heard you didn't walk out going man that was the most awesomest worship experience i ever had no you walked out by saying god the people here are just nice well look what nice people did to you and imagine you being nice to somebody else what would it do for them we all have a place that's being rich towards God. And then lastly, being in the community of believers, growing in him in a life group. Because growth doesn't happen just coming to church. Growth happens in groups. We got to be connected before we're committed. So let's get some connection. The second thing is act like a steward and not an owner. Act like a steward and not an owner. Like, God, you've given me this. I'm passing through. It all belongs to you. I'm going to do it. The Bible says it. Look what it says. And by love with Psalms 24 says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Lord, it's yours. It's never mine. Because here's what mine does to you. Mine brings you into the attitude of yourself. His brings you into the attitude of everyone. At the end of the day, I don't want it to be mine. I always want it to be his because I want to have an eternal impact on people's lives. Number three, view everything through the lens of eternity. If you will live your life viewing everything through the lens of eternity, you'll make wise decisions. You will not make decisions, listen to me, based on pressure. You'll make decisions based on principles. When I view everything through the lens of eternity, I'll do it. I love what Hebrews says. It says this, he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of a greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead towards his reward. Think about that as I close. He was looking ahead towards his reward. Hey, I'm, not, I'm, I'm okay getting talked about. I'm okay going through stuff. If I have something to look forward to. Hey, man, I, it may be a, a tough tomorrow, but I sure got a great weekend planned. I got something to look forward to. When you are, lit, when you are seeing everything through the views of eternity, nothing can really get you here because you have something you're looking forward to. And lastly, number four, 
Be intentional. Be intentional. What what, what does that mean? It's that you decide every day, I want to be a blessing to somebody. You decide every day, I want to help someone. You decide every day, I, I choose nothing less than a great day today. Doesn't mean I'll have moments. Doesn't mean there would be no conflict. Doesn't mean that there's going to be some moments in that day that are going to be tough. But I woke up and I decided before I stepped out of my house, I am expecting a great day. Listen to me. Expectation keeps your eyes focused on something that is bigger than something that is now. I expect big things. I expect my marriage today to be great. Man, I expect every day, I'm waking up tomorrow morning, I expect my children to excel in school. I expect those things. I expect God to be so good to me. I expect to be a blessing to somebody else. I'm going to find an opportunity to just be a blessing to someone. I I choose to to, to live with that expectation. That's just being intentional. See, Paul says it like this. In 2 Corinthians, he says, "I, I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over and make up your own mind like God's mind's already made. You got to make up your own. He says this, what will you give? That will you protect you against some sob stories and arm twisting. God loves it when the giver delights in the giving. Pastor Obed, I don't feel like I'm being loved. Wake up tomorrow morning and say, I decide today to love somebody. Pastor Obed, I, I, I just feel like I'm lonely. I got no friends. You wake up tomorrow morning, you decide, today I'm going to be the best friend to somebody because in return, God's going to fulfill that in my life. What are you saying? I am just saying I want to be rich towards God. God wants Obed to be wealthy, wealthy in love, wealthy in joy, wealthy in faith, wealthy in in peace, wealthy in self-discipline. God wants me to live that because if I'm wealthy in faith, I got faith to give away. If I am wealthy in love, I got love to give away. If I'm wealthy in joy, I got joy to give away. That's what wealth is. So if I could be wealthy in love and I could be and give it away, if I could be wealthy in faith and I can give it away, if I can be wealthy in peace and give it away, and you can be wealthy with riches and do the same thing with it. Give it away. And when you do, you make an eternal impact, not a temporary impact, an eternal impact where lives matter because when you take care of God's children it's like somebody taking care of yours and he is going to just shower you with incredible blessings my pastor said something to me that I'll never forget he says I'm going to send Joseph to you Joseph's our, our uni director here. And I'll never forget what he said after that. He said, Obed, nobody will ever love me more than someone who can love my own children. In other words, if you're going to make that impact in my son, I'm going to do whatever I can to help you and bless you and do everything. Listen, watch this. Listen to me and we're done. I'm going to let you go. Watch the Dodger game. Here it is. Some of you are already looking at your phones. Don't tell me the score yet. I want to be surprised, okay? Watch this. Nobody. I believe God, the Father, says this to you and I. Nobody will ever love me more. Speaking of the Father, 
Nobody will ever love me more than someone who is willing to love my own children. I've come to this place in my life that it's not that I want to love God more for me. It's that I want to love God more so that I can love more of his children. And when I do, he will bless me in a way that I won't have to worry about a thing in my life because when you take care of the Father, by taking care of his children, the Father will take care of you in Jesus' name. Come on, do you receive that today? Come on, do you decide I want to be rich towards God? Come on, do you decide today, Destiny? We want to be rich towards God. Can I tell you this? You will never miss what you invest in eternity. You'll never miss it because it'll always come back a thousandfold. Father, I pray for, for everybody here tonight. Lord, I, I pray for everyone here tonight. God, because we want to be rich towards you. We know loving you gives us the ability to love your children that need to be loved. God, I thank you that we're living this life for that life. Something so bigger than us, greater than us. But I thank you that, that tomorrow when I wake up, I'm going to be so intentional to be everything you want me to be. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to let tomorrow decide what kind of day I'm going to have. I'm going to wake up tomorrow and decide what kind of day I'm going to have. This is the day that you have made, and I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it today. And God, I'm, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for you. I'm so thankful for what you're doing. God, you're an awesome God, and you're a mighty God, and you're an everlasting God, and you have such great things for us today. If this message touched your life and you would like to take your next step, visit destiny.online slash meet to get connected to one of our pastors. For more information and updates, visit us online or on Facebook and Instagram. See you next week.